それを作る知識って全部入るので、まあ、個人で全部こうあの生産することができたわけなんですけどもだんだんこの一人の頭の中にあのこの知識がもう入らない、まあ、それをに対してなどうやって社会は対応したかっていうとこう企業っていうのを作るわけですよねでこの一つの企業の中にたくさんの人たちが一生懸命情報を共有しながらこうプロダクト商品をこう生み出していくと。まあ、80年代の,、まあ、あのいろんな例あると思うんですけど日本で考えるとソニーのウォークマンだとか、まあ、任天堂ファミコンなんかは一つの会社の中で比較的に秘密の中で一生懸命開発してそれをポンとこう世の中に出してヒットになるただだんだんだんだんネットワーク社会になってくると何が起きてきたかっていうとそのまず商品がだんだん複雑になってくるわけですよね。この複雑になっててくるとその一社の抱え込める複雑性をもう超えてしまってこうあの複数の会社がまあ、一緒にやっていくっていうのが今の多分ネットワーク社会の現実なんですけども、まあ、今度先を考えると多分それでは足りなくなってきてどんどんどんどん情報をもう個人間で共有して、まあ、我々はコモンズと呼んでるんですけども、まあ、オープンソースとかそういうフリーのソフトウェアだとか情報がまあ世界中に飛び回るでこういうまあ我々の,この MIT みたいなこの大きな大学とか学会同士で情報を共有してるだけではなくて世界全体の情報がまあ一つのあのまあ、シェアされたプールになっていくっていうのが多分企業を超えたネットワーク社会だと思います。And in the future, as we go forward, we will of course experience terrible things. There will be wars, there will be depressions, there will be natural disasters. Awful things will happen in this century. I'm absolutely sure. But I'm also sure that because of the connections people are making and the ability of ideas to to meet and to mate as never before. I'm also sure that technology will advance and therefore living standards will advance. There was no progress, no innovation. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, but it's true. Whereas the object on the right is obsolete after five years. And there's another difference too, which is the object on the left is made from one substance. The object on the right is made from a confection of different substances, from silicon and metal and plastic and so on. And more than that, it's a confection of different ideas. The idea of plastic, the idea of a laser, the idea of transistors, they've all been combined together in this technology. And it's this combination, this, this cumulative technology that intrigues me, because I think it's the secret to understanding what's happening in the world. My body's an accumulation of ideas too. The idea of skin cells, the idea of brain cells, the idea of liver cells, they've come together. How does evolution do cumulative combinatorial things? Well, it uses sexual reproduction. In an asexual species, if you get two different mutations in different creatures, a green one and a red one, then one has to be better than the other, one goes extinct for the other to survive. But if you have a sexual species, then it's possible for an individual to inherit both mutations from different lineages. So what sex does is it enables the individual to draw upon the genetic innovations of the whole species. It's not confined to its own lineage. What's the process that's having the same effect in cultural evolution as sex is having in biological evolution? And I think the answer is exchange. The habit of exchanging one thing for another. It's a unique human feature. No other animal does it. You can teach them in the laboratory to do a little bit of exchange, and indeed there's reciprocity in other animals, but the exchange of one object for another never happens. As Adam Smith said, no man ever saw a dog make a fair exchange of a bone with another dog. <laughs> you can have culture without exchange. You can have, as it were, asexual culture. Chimpanzees, killer whales, these kind of creatures, they have culture. They teach each other traditions, which are handed down from parent to offspring. This, in this case, chimpanzees teaching each other how to crack nuts with rocks. But the difference is that these cultures never expand, never grow, never accumulate, never become combinatorial. And the reason is because there is no sex, as it were. There is no、uh, exchange of ideas. Chimpanzee troops have different cultures in different troops. There's no exchange of ideas between them. And why does exchange raise living standards? Well, the answer came from David Ricardo in 1817. And here's a Stone Age version of his story, although he told it in terms of trade between countries. Adam takes four hours to make a spear and three hours to make an axe. Oz takes one hour to make a spear and two hours to make an axe. So Oz is better at both spears and axes than Adam. He doesn't need Adam. He can make his own spears and axes. Well, no, because if you think about it, if Oz makes two spears and Adam makes two axes, and then they trade, Then they will each have saved an hour of work. 
And the more they do this, the more true it's going to be. Because the more they do this, the better Adam is going to get at making axes, and the better Oz is going to get at making spears. So the gains from trade are only going to grow. And this is one of the beauties of exchange, is it actually creates the momentum for more specialization, which creates the momentum for more exchange and so on. Adam and Oz both saved an hour of time. That is prosperity, the saving of time in satisfying your needs. Ask yourself how long you would have to work to provide for yourself an hour of reading light this evening to read a book by. If you had to start from scratch, let's say you, you go out into the countryside, you find a sheep, you kill it, you get the fat out of it, you render it down, you make a candle, etc., etc. How long is it going to take you? Quite a long time. How long do you actually have to work to earn an hour of reading light if you're on the average wage in Britain today? And the answer is about half a second. Back in 1950, you would have had to work for eight seconds on the average wage to acquire that much light. And that's seven and a half seconds of prosperity that you've gained since 1950, as it were, because that's seven and a half seconds in which you can do something else or you can acquire, acquire another good or service. And back in 1880, it would have been 15 minutes to earn that amount of light on the average wage. Back in 1800, you'd have had to work six hours to earn a candle that could burn for an hour. In other words, the average person on the average wage could not afford a candle in 1800. Go back to this image of the axe and the mouse and ask yourself who made them and for who. The stone axe was made by someone for himself. It was self-sufficiency. We call that poverty these days. But the object on the right was made for me by other people. How many other people? Tens? Hundreds? Thousands? You know, I think it's probably millions. Because you've got to include the man who grew the coffee, which was brewed for the man who was on the oil rig, who was drilling for oil, which was going to be made into the plastic, etc. They were all working for me, to make a mouse for me. And that's the, that's the way society works. That's what uh, we've achieved as a species. In the old days, if you were rich, you literally had people working for you. That's how you got to be rich. You employed them. Louis XIV had a lot of people working for him. They made his silly outfits like this, and they, made his, <laughs> and they did his silly hairstyles or whatever. He had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night. But a modern tourist going around the Palace of Versailles and looking at Louis XIV's pictures... He has 498 people doing his dinner tonight, too. They're in bistros and cafes and restaurants and shops all over Paris, and they're all ready to serve you at an hour's notice with an excellent meal that's probably got higher quality than Louis XIV even had. And that's what we've done, because we're all working for each other, where we were able to, to draw upon specialization and exchange to raise each other's living standards. Now, you do get other animals working for each other, too. Ants are a classic example. Workers work for queens, and queens work for workers. But there's a big difference which is that it only happens within the colony. There's no working for each other across the colonies. And the reason for that is because there's a reproductive division of labor. That is to say, they specialize with respect to reproduction. The queen does it all. In our species, we don't like doing that. It's the one thing we insist on doing for ourselves, is reproduction. <laughs> Even in England, we don't <laughs> leave reproduction to the queen. So when did this habit start, and how long has it been going on, and what does it mean? Well, I think probably the oldest version of this is probably the sexual division of labor, but I've got no evidence for that. It just looks like the first thing we did was work male for female and female for male. In all hunter-gatherer societies today, there's a foraging division of labor between, on the whole, hunting males and gathering females. It isn't always quite that simple, but there's a, there's a, there's a distinction between specialized roles for males and females. And the beauty of this system is that it benefits both sides. The woman knows that in the Hadza's case here, digging roots to share with men in exchange for meat, she knows that all she has to do to get access to protein is to dig some extra roots and trade them for meat. And that she doesn't have to go on an exhausting hunt and try and kill a warthog. And the man knows that he doesn't have to do any digging to get um, roots. All he has to do is make sure that when he kills a warthog, it's big enough to share some. And so both sides raise each other's standards of living through the sexual division of labor. When did this happen? We don't know, but it's possible that Neanderthals didn't do this. They were a highly cooperative species. They were a highly intelligent species. Their brains, on average, by the end, were bigger than yours and mine in this room today. Uh, they were imaginative. They buried their dead. They had language, probably, because we know they had the FOXP2 gene of the same kind as us, which was discovered here in Oxford. And so it looks like they probably had linguistic skills. They were brilliant people. I'm not dissing the Neanderthals. But they, 
but there's no evidence of a sexual division of labor. There's no evidence of gathering behavior by females. It looks like the females were cooperative hunters with the men. And the other thing there's no evidence for is exchange between groups. Because the objects that you find in Neanderthal remains, the, the tools they made, are always made from local materials. For example, in the Caucasus, there's a site where you find local Neanderthal tools. They're always made from local chert. In the same valley, there are modern human remains from about the same date, 30,000 years ago. And some of those are from local chert, but, more, but many of them are made from obsidian from a long way away. And when human beings began moving objects around like this, it was evidence that they were exchanging between groups. Trade is 10 times as old as farming. People forget that. People think of trade as a modern thing. Exchange between groups has been going on for 100,000 years. And this, the earliest evidence for it crops up somewhere between 80 and 120,000 years ago in Africa when you see obsidian and jasper and other things moving long distances in Ethiopia. You also see these seashells 